And all of this eventually culminated in a big social explosion. There's a concept that comes from Hegel. They call quality into quantity. So this is a book. It's my book, actually, City Builders and Mantles in Our Age. But it's a book, right? If I started ripping pages out of this book, it would be a book that's missing a few pages. If I kept ripping pages out, it would be a book that's missing a few pages. Not much is really changing, except the book is missing a few pages. But if we just kept ripping pages out, Eventually, we'd get down to there was a single page left, and one page is not a book. So we've gone from minor quality changes, whereas we're just changing the nature of the book, reducing the number of pages, to once we had a book and we don't have a book anymore, right? And that concept, that understanding that minor changes gradually add up to big dramatic changes, and that's quality into quantity. It's a key concept from Hegel. Marx used it as well. And the explosion that happened in Europe in the 1700s, where we saw the overthrow of feudalism, was one of the greatest explosions in global history. We saw the feudal commons being broken up. We saw that mercantile class that was neither a peasant nor a landowner seizing power. And it was a dramatic social explosion. And it launched the beginning of a period that you can call primitive accumulation. And the period of primitive accumulation was when the feudal system was being ripped apart and the mercantile class was taking power. And it was a quite violent period. You know about the French Revolution, right? Liberty, egality, fraternity, the reign of terror, mass executions. In Britain, for example, uh, King Henry VIII uh, very famously started executing homeless people, vagrants, vagabonds. They were being executed. And they made it a crime to be homeless. All these people who were peasants who had a place on the land, all of a sudden were being kicked off the land as the land's being turned into the private property of a capitalist or an owner. So thousands of people suddenly had no place in society. So they started killing them in mass. Uh, there was an uprising in Scotland, the Jacobite uprising. And in the aftermath of that uprising, there was genocide committed against the Scottish Highlanders. And in big numbers, they started slaughtering and exterminating the Scottish Highlanders. And capitalism was created in a very violent way. The transnational slave trade, right? Where people were being taken from Africa to the United States and to the Caribbean, millions dying in the process, horrendous, right? We know about the killing of the Native Americans in South, Central, and North America. It was a horrendous process. The establishment of capitalism, primitive accumulation, laying the basis of the capitalist system, turning the feudal commons and estates into private property was very violent. It was mass theft. You know, you get this, that, that defenders of capitalism will say, well, well, socialism is theft, right? Well, the capitalists all just work hard, right, to, to create what they have, and, and these socialists just want to take it away. Well, capitalism began with primitive accumulation, mass theft and killing on a massive scale. And that was the first period of capitalism you can call primitive accumulation. But eventually, we know that these merchants, with their trade routes, laid the basis for factory owners and industry. And we started to see the beginning of the second period of capitalism, the period of industrialization. Right? We saw the factory system coming into being. And that was the second period of capitalism. We, we saw the beginning of industrialization. So we have a factory owner. Maybe it's a loom, maybe it's a textile mill, maybe it's a steel mill. And these workers are working to produce products. And we have the factory owner the capitalist who hires the workers to work in his factory, pays them a wage, takes the product that's produced and sells it to make a profit. And his income comes through owning, whereas the factory worker sells their labor and their income comes through working and renting themselves out to a boss, right? This is the two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat coming into existence. And the factory owner, has a contrary interest with the factory worker, right? The factory owner wants to pay the worker as little as possible. The worker wants to get paid as much as possible. They have a contradiction of interests. And then that leads to a problem a problem in the way factory production is carried out. So let's say that you're producing a product, right? Let's say that the product you're making is this pen. Right? So in order to have this pen, first you have to hire workers to assemble it. So that's your labor costs, A. And then 
you're going to need the materials to make the pen, B, right? And then on top of that, you're going to need to, to ship the pens to where they're being sold, so that's C, right? And the total cost of the pen is D. But here's the problem, right? The labor costs can never be equal to the total cost of the pen, right? Or else there would, you wouldn't be able to pay for everything else, or else the capitalists wouldn't be able to make any profits. So A cannot equal D. And the problem is those labor costs, those workers are also consumers. And the worker can never buy back the product he produces. And this is the basis of the boom bust cycle, where you have pretty soon the market being glutted with products that can't be sold. And this is what makes capitalism a naturally unstable system, is that the worker can never buy back the product he produces. And on top of that, the capitalist is constantly trying to advance technology to make production as efficient as possible. But at the same time, the worker uh, can't buy back the product. So the capitalist is driving to fill the market with as many products as possible, but pay the worker as little as possible in order to buy the products, and it leads to that boom-bust cycle. And we talk about the Federal Reserve System. We talk about all kinds of mechanisms that have been invented by governments. You know, the invention of the corporation and stock ownership. All kinds of things have been done to try and resolve this basic contradiction. But as long as you have capitalist production, you're still going to have this problem, right? And during the period of industrialization, we saw huge achievements taking place, right? We saw, you know, all kinds of inventions invented for the purpose of making production more efficient, electric lights, radios, all kinds of inventions and achievements taking place, but we saw frequent panics and collapses and, and it, was, it was very, very unstable, right? They talk about the, the sweatshops that existed, they talk about you know, the textile mills and people suffering. This was all happening in Europe. But eventually, this gave way to the next stage of capitalist development. Which is imperialism. So imperialism began with the factory owners and the captains of industry being replaced by bankers and finance capitalists and lenders. And there's a fundamental difference between a banker and a factory owner. Because a banker makes money through lending money. A factory owner makes money through selling products. So a factory owner, he wants to pay his workers as little as possible, right? He, uh, at the same time, he wants to sell as many products as possible. But a factory owner generally wants society to become wealthier because the more prosperous people are, the more products he can sell. But a banker is very different. A banker simply wants to continue making money through lending money. And with imperialism and the rise of finance capital, we saw a, a, a dominance and the emergence of international cartels, huge multinational corporations going across the world and essentially carving out spheres of influence. Talk about the opium wars in China, where they forced China to accept the importation of narcotics, forced them to accept products from Britain, uh, not allow any tariffs, beat down the economy. Um, the USA seized the Philippines, right? We know about the Spanish-American War, but not much is written about the Philippine-American War, which was hundreds of thousands of people killed in the Philippines, forcing the Philippines to be a captive market. And what's different between imperialism and industrialization is that during industrialization, that was the capitalists trying to raise the living standards in their home country, trying to expand the apparatus of production. But imperialism was the emergence of huge multinational cartels that were actively trying to stop development in the third world, in Asia and Africa and Latin America. They're going there and they're trying to hold back economic development, keep these countries poor, captive markets, make them dependent on international corporations. Uh, for example, when the British went to India, they very famously burned down all the textile mills. India had a huge textile loom apparatus. They burned it all down and forced them to import their cloth from Britain. Right? That's imperialism. And in the time of imperialism, we saw the standard of living in the first world increasing at the expense of beating down any industrialization in the third world. And in the first world, you had the emergence of what you could call the labor aristocracy. And these were workers that were working class people, worked in a factory, worked in manufacturing, but they were well paid enough that they identified with the bosses and aligned with the, their own big corporations against the people in the developing world. And while you know, the USA was bombing Korea and bombing Vietnam and destroying countries in, in mass, you had 
you know, very prosperous manufacturing jobs in the home country, right? You had this aristocracy of labor that was necessary in order to have the unity in the first world in order to continue underdeveloping and beating down and halting development in the third world. And that was imperialism. In Lenin's book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, describes this period in which banks dominate over corporations, in which they're carving out spheres of influence in the developing world, in which you have an aristocracy of labor that develops in the home country. He describes it very accurately. But then, imperialism gives way to the stage that we're in now, which is called accumulation through destruction. A friend of mine actually coined the phrase accumulation through destruction. During the period of imperialism, at that point, you had an effort to beat down development in the developing world, but to develop and raise living standards in the first world. You had this labor aristocracy of good paying industrial jobs that laid the basis for a prosperous economy in the first world at the expense of the third world. But what's happening now is essentially we're seeing the elimination of the labor aristocracy. And this method through which capitalists are starting to make money off of society further impoverishing. In a socialist society, self-driving cars would be a good thing. It would mean less work, and those who make, make their living driving cars could do something more, more rewarding. They could, you know, it would be great, it would be great. That would be less work for everybody, because the cars can drive themselves. But under capitalism, it means mass unemployment. It means the elimination of millions of jobs. We know about the military-industrial complex, which is a big aspect of the period of imperialism, but now we have a prison-industrial complex. Fine, people are more unemployed, people don't have jobs. Well, we can make money by locking them in jail. You know, capitalists are enriching themselves. You know about the opioid epidemic. Millions of Americans are getting addicted to opioids, and so now, you know, it, it's a way to make money. You talk about, you know, the oil prices shooting up very dramatically during the Bush years because Iraq, an oil-producing country, was blown to bits, blown off the market. A country is destroyed, and then that makes the, the oil in the hands of American corporations tied in with Saudi Arabia far more valuable. You see Libya, an oil-producing country, blown to bits and destroyed, and that makes the oil in the Western countries more and more valuable. Um, this is essentially the period we're in where instead of trying to hold back development in the third world and trying to develop the first world, the capitalists have gotten to the point that they are now underdeveloping the first world in a global race to the bottom. And we see an unfolding low-wage police state in the United States with civil liberties being stripped away. We see roads that are not being properly paved. Uh, we see bridges that are not secure. We see drinking water that is not being purified. Basically, what the imperialists were doing to the developing world, they're now doing to the first world as a process of capitalism's development from imperialism, its third stage, up into its fourth stage of accumulation through destruction. And that's capitalism. This is a continuation of capitalism. Capitalism is a system where the means of production only function as preliminary transformation into capital. Mao Zedong said capitalism is a system where profits are in command. And that is the natural, this is the natural conclusion of it. We've got huge multinational corporations getting wealthier, while the entire world is getting poorer and poorer. We have technology eliminating labor, and millions of people no longer having a place at the assembly line, while huge multinational corporations and banks based in Western countries become wealthier and wealthier. This is the reality of capitalism, and that is my first section, which I called, What is Capitalism? And that's my explanation of what capitalism is. And I think we'll break, we'll have our first break and discussion now of that period. Sound good?